News of the Times Serial Killer Saturdays The Derby Family Murders Welcome to News of the Times. In this episode, we are in 1903. Today's episode starts in an innocuous way. An older gentleman, in response to negotiations to buy a commercial property, goes to visit the owner at his house, and whilst there, he is viciously assaulted with an iron bar. His screams attract the neighbours as he stumbles out of the house, bleeding profusely. The police are rapidly called in. What quickly unfolds from there is a particularly gruesome triple murder. The bodies have been relatively freshly murdered and dismembered, with the body pieces being placed into sacks and then buried in the small back garden of the house. Clothing, furniture and even the missing family's dog are all found at the house in question. We look into the backstory and the crimes of the Essex Leighton Mysteries. We hope you enjoy the show. It is early 1903. England, and London especially, is still recovering from the brutal Ripper slayings. Who was the Ripper? Will he strike again? It is during this time that the George Chapman trial begins, and much of the attention is diverted to that trial and the questions surrounding his many murders. And yet... From the Bristol Times and Mirror, Wednesday the 31st of December, 1902. A Leighton Mystery. Gentlemen attacked in an empty house. Three bodies discovered. A correspondent at Leighton in Essex reports that yesterday an elderly gentleman went to view a house in Church Road, and while doing so was, it is alleged, attacked by the man in charge with an iron bar. His screams attracted the neighbours and the police who were called, who broke into the house and found the old man bleeding from his head. He had to be removed to the hospital. The caretaker was arrested, charged with assault and remanded. In consequence of suspicions, a police inspector had the garden of the house dug up, with the result, it is stated, that the bodies of three men were found buried. How they came there is at present a mystery. This was the newspaper article which would eventually unfold to reveal the sinister plot of recently released prisoner Edgar Edwards, 34, and his plan to find family-owned businesses, kill the family, hide their remains, run their businesses for a few months while stealing their possessions, and then reselling the business and doing the same thing again to a different family business. The brutal attack on the gentleman helped to expose the planned out vicious murder of the Derby family. In 1902, in an unforeseen turn of events, the unassuming realm of Camberwell became the backdrop for a sinister tale that would send chills down the spines of its residents. It all began with a seemingly innocent newspaper advertisement catching the attention of a man named Edwards. The words beckoned him to 22 Wyndham Road, a grocer's shop, nestled within the tranquil streets of this South London borough. Eager to seize the opportunity, Edwards presented himself to the proprietor, John William Darby, accompanied by his devoted wife, Beatrice. Their visit, which took place in the early days of December in 1902, unfolded with the air of amaliability. Edwards with a veneer of sincerity, expressed his conviction that the shop 
before him was the very embodiment of his desires. He assured Darby and Beatrice that he would promptly assume the responsibilities of proprietorship and swiftly appoint a capable manager to oversee its operations. From the Western Daily Press, the 1st of January 1903, a latent mystery, gruesome discovery. The mysterious discovery made at Leighton when three mutilated bodies were found buried in a garden was to some extent elucidated yesterday by the identification of the victims and a man named Edgar Edwards is charged with causing their deaths. The circumstances of the tragedy extend over a period of about two months, but only during the last few days have the police become possessed of information justifying them in charging Edwards. The prisoner was charged at Stratford Police Court on Christmas Eve with committing a violent assault on an elderly man named John Garland of Leytonstone by striking him on the head with a piece of iron. And whilst the accused was under remand, police investigations revealed a terrible story. The names of the persons who are supposed to have been murdered are William John Darby, aged 38, Beatrice Darby, his wife, aged 28, and their baby, aged three months. They were respectably connected and kept a shop at Wyndham Road, Camberwell, which they were supposed to have sold to Edwards about the middle of November when they suddenly disappeared. Edwards then took up residence there until early in December when he moved to 39 Church Road in Leighton, buried in the back garden of which the mutilated bodies were discovered. Edwards was assisted with the Wyndham Road business by a sort of handyman, and subsequently he and Edwards were seen to drive a covered van to the shop, lift into it some furniture and a couple of boxes, supposed to contain crockery ware and drive away. Since then, the Camberwell business has been closed. A few days previously, a man named Rawlins had been engaged to dig at the back garden at the Leighton house, and he assisted in unloading the furniture and boxes. From the time of the disappearance of the Darbys, their friends felt that all was not well and communicated with the police. When Edwards was in custody and his house searched, Neighbours told of strange happenings in the garden, and the outcome was the discovery of the bodies. In the upstairs rooms were clothing belonging to Mr. and Mrs. Darby, and a small dog formerly belonging to Mrs. Darby was also found in Edward's possession, and, it was said, was continually smelling around the spot where his master and mistress were buried and would not move away. The officers also found a letter purporting to be a reference from Mr. Darby to a house agent of whom Edwards took the house at Leighton. The bodies, when discovered, presented a shocking sight. They were tied in half a dozen sacks. The head, the arms, and legs had been severed, but although decomposed, were identified by the deceased's relatives. On searching the premises at Wyndham Road, the police discovered evidence of bloodshed, whilst on the floor, wrapped in paper, was a window sash weight with blood marks on it. An old rusty saw was also found, which had been handed to an analyst. The appearance of the room indicated that it had recently been washed. The Darbys had been in the Wyndham Road business about 12 months, but as it was not satisfactory, advertised it for sale, and Edwards entered into negotiations. 
The inquest will be open tomorrow, but probably only formal evidence will be taken. The accused was brought up at Stratford Police Court yesterday morning. He is pale, rather cadaverous-looking man, more than average height. On being placed in the dock, the magistrate reminded him that he was charged on remand with maliciously wounding John Garland. He would now be further charged with killing William Beatrix and Eleanor Darby of 22 Wyndham Road, Camberwell, on or about the 29th of November. Edwards replied, There must be some mistake. The only witness was Detective Inspector Collins, who described the condition which the bodies were found in the prisoner's back garden and also detailed many of the circumstances narrated above. A remand for the week was granted. The murder. The murder had clearly been planned out. The murder weapon came from the weight system sash windows of the time. Sash windows, popular at the time, were in essence a weighty frame equipped with a concealed iron counterweight, giving the user the ability to ascend and descend the windows with ease. This mechanism operated by means of a sturdy cord, its purpose hidden from view. Edwards arrived at the appointed meeting, having in his possession both the sash weight and the cord, ensuring that the murder was pre-planned. It is now believed, amidst the chilling silence of that fateful encounter, that Edwards, driven by an unspeakable malevolence, brandished his chosen instruments to unleash a brutal assault upon John William Darby and his wife Beatrice. The blows delivered with callous intent snuffed out their lives, staining the once tranquil atmosphere with the irrevocable tragedy of their demise. And yet the grim fate that awaited their innocent ten-month-old daughter Ethel was far from over. In a macabre twist, it is alleged that Edwards, devoid of humanity, employed the very cord that had facilitated the movement of the sash windows to extinguish the precious life that clung to the cradle of the Derby family. Edwards next found himself confronted with the ominous task of concealing the lifeless forms of the ill-fated Darby family. With a calculated resolve, he secreted their bodies away in a concealed chamber above the shop, shrouded in an eerie veil of darkness. Unbeknownst to the unsuspecting shop manager, a certain Mr. Goodwin and his wife, who, for several days, dutifully presided over the business, the grisly secret lay dormant above them. On the 10th of November, Edwards explained to his recently hired manager that he was going to sell the shop. In order to sell the shop, the bodies which had been dumped above the shop had to be disposed of. Edwards took the opportunity to cut the bodies up place them in Hessian sacks and relay them to the Leighton house and bury them in the back garden. It took all of their furnishing, their crockery, many of their personal items such as clothes and even their dog as his own and he transported it all to his newly acquired Leighton home. From the Manchester Evening News, the 1st of January, 1903. Gruesome discovery in Essex. Supposed triple murder, bodies buried in garden. An extraordinary and shocking discovery which, according to present indications, points to the commission of triple murder was made yesterday afternoon in Church Road, Leighton in Essex. About one month ago, a man named Edgar Edwards, aged 34, by occupation a grocer, became the tenant 
of a house in Church Road, and taking possession of the premises, he took with him several large boxes. Shortly afterwards, he had the back garden dug up in order, as he said, to lay out flower beds. In some way, he became acquainted with an old man, and about a week ago, when Edwards and the old man were in, the former committed assault on his elderly acquaintance, which was of such a violent character that information was given to the police and Edwards was arrested. He was brought up before the magistrate at the Stratford Police Court in the ordinary course and remanded into custody while the circumstances of the assault were being investigated. First Suspicions The landlord of the house in Church Road appears to have become suspicious of his tenant and accordingly went to Police Inspector Young and communicated information of such a character that that officer proceeded with several other policemen to Edward's house yesterday afternoon. A search was made of the garden, which is only a small one, and had, as already stated, been recently dug up. On turning over the soil, the officers were horrified to come across some human remains, but their horror increased as they pursued their gruesome task, because it speedily became evident that there was more than one body buried in the simple-looking garden. Finally, the policemen ceased their terrible task, and when the remains they had gathered came to be examined, it was found that they represented the mutilated bodies of three persons. The bodies were those of a man aged about 25 years old, a woman apparently about the same age, and the third the body of a baby about three months old. The heads, arms and legs of both the man and the woman had been severed, and the skulls of both showed powerful signs of having been struck with some heavy instrument. The baby had a handkerchief tied tightly around its neck, and death in its case was evidently due to strangulation. The three bodies were removed to the local mortuary, and the police are pursuing their investigations. The charge against Edwards. Edwards was still in custody, and up to the present, the only charge against him is that of assaulting the old man. It does not, of course, follow that because he happened to be the tenant of the premises at the time of the discovery of the bodies, that he had any connection with the placing of them in the position in which they were found. But all the appearances indicate only too clearly that the house in Church Road must have been the scene of a terrible triple crime about a month ago. It seems somewhat strange that the police of the district should have been sent for at least a month past without any information of any missing persons being sent to them. The district is not very thickly populated, and the possibilities of a full-grown man and woman and young baby being killed and buried in a garden in a public street is regarded with something like terror by the police and the people in the neighbourhood. Police Court Proceedings A Grocer in the Dock At Stratford Police Court today, Edgar Edwards, 34, grocer of Church Road, was charged on remand with unlawfully and maliciously wounding John Garland by striking him on the head with a piece of iron and inflicting grievous bodily harm on the 23rd of December. There was, however, brought against him a further charge, which ran as follows, that he did feloniously kill and slay William John Darby, aged 26, and Beatrice Darby, his wife, aged 28, and Ellen Beatrice Darby, aged three months, on or about 
the 28th of November at 22 Wyndham Road, Camberwell. As soon as the charges had been read in court, the prisoner exclaimed to the magistrate, Sure, sir, there is some great mistake. Detective Inspector Collins stepped into the witness box and said that as the charge was now one of murder, he asked that the prisoner be remanded on the original charge, that of wounding, so that the whole of the facts might be laid before the public prosecutor. The bodies, said the inspector, were found buried in a garden of a house occupied by the prisoner, and evidence would be adduced that furniture and effects belonging to the deceased were found in that house. The inspector added that the bodies were cut into eight pieces and were in six sacks. The child appeared to have been strangled by something tied round its neck, and a blood-stained weapon was discovered in the house. Mr Chapman, the magistrate, reminded the prisoner who was once removed at once. With the evidence of the neighbour's evidence, the freshly murdered cut up bodies in the backyard of his newly acquired house. Bled evidence was upstairs in the shop. Edgar's ownership of the known Derby dog, personal items known to have belonged to the Derby family, possession of the bloody rusty saw that had been used to dismember the family, and the case against Edwards was strong, and he was remanded for trial. The trial was begun on the 12th of February. The case of George Chapman was ongoing at the time, so this latent tragedy did not get the front pages it normally would have done. From the onset, Edward's behaviour was marked as strange. He regularly interrupted proceedings with comments or just plainly refused to answer. From the Daily News in London, 13th of February 1903, the Leighton Horror, Trial of Edgar Edwards, Prisoner's Strange Conduct. Mr Justice Wright yesterday commenced the trial at the Old Bailey of Edgar Edwards, aged 44, a tall, powerfully built man described in the calendar as a clerk on indictments charging him with having willfully murdered William John Beatrice and Ethel Darby at Camberwell and with having attempted to murder John Garland's at the house at Church Road in Leighton, the garden of which the mutilated bodies of the Darbys were found buried. The particular count of the indictment which the case was tried was that charging the willful murder of William John Darby, but the whole of the facts were opened by counsel. Remarkable indictment. The prisoner was brought into the dock in charge of three warders and accompanied by Dr. Scott, the prison surgeon. He remained standing throughout the trial, but repeatedly interrupted the proceedings and passed a number of memoranda to his solicitor and counsel. I'm being called by the clerk of arraigns, Mr. Avery, to say whether he was guilty or not guilty of the willful murder of William John Darby, the prisoner refused at first to reply. He then exclaimed, I don't want any nonsense. The clerk of arraigns again asked the question and the re prisoner refused to answer. The clerk then added, Are you hearing what I say? And Edwards responded, You have no business to ask me such questions. The clerk of arraigns said, you must answer yes or no. Edwards replied, Stuff and nonsense. Mr Justice Wright thereupon directed a plea of not guilty to be entered and the trial proceeded. Incidents at Leighton, the horrible discovery at Leighton. Edwards, about this time, opened negotiations with a house agent at Leighton and was thus brought 
into the acquaintance of the man John Garland. On three occasions subsequently, the 5th and the 8th of December, Edwards drove certain things in a pony cart from Camberwell to his Leighton house, and on the 9th he hired and drove a van there. Amongst the things conveyed in the pony cart were two sacks, which were sufficiently heavy to necessitate Edwards carrying them upon his back. On the 10th of December, the prisoner left the shop at Camberwell and was seen no more by the Goodwins until he was in custody. But in the meantime, there were pawnings by the prisoner of a number of articles which were the property of the Derbys. On the 9th of December, Edwards was seen by a neighbour digging a deep hole in the garden of the house at Leighton. The hole was in fact so deep that although the neighbour was looking from a window in the top of the house, he could only see the crown of the prisoner's head. The next morning, that hole was found to have been filled in. Edwards had been carrying on negotiations with John Garland for the purchase of his business, and on the 23rd of December, Garland called at the house in Church Road and saw Edwards. When Garland was about to leave, Edwards attacked him from behind with a sash weight wrapped in paper, striking him a murderous blow to the head. Fortunately, Garland did not lose his senses. He struggled with the prisoner and eventually got out of the door and raised an alarm. As the police arrived, Edwards was found locked in a bedroom, changing his clothes, which were covered with blood. Water in a bath was found tinged with red. Edwards said he was attacked and that he struck back with the first thing that came to his hand and Edwards was arrested. The discovery of the bodies in the hole in the garden. In dismembering the bodies, a saw had been used. In the house of Camberwell, there were various bloodstains upon the walls and upon a table. This completed the story of one of the most gruesome crimes ever placed before the court, and counsel invited the jury upon these facts to say that the prisoner was guilty of willful murder. The motive, he suggested, having been to get possession of the business and property of the murdered man. Darby was murdered by means of a sash weight, and Edwards was found in possession of of that weight. Is the prisoner insane? Dr. Luff's evidence was interesting in the sense that it seemed to indicate from the position of the blood spot found in the room at Camberwell, the positions of the murdered man and a woman at the time that they were attacked. He said that the spots on the fireplace must have proceeded from a person sitting in front of the fire and those higher up from a person standing. In cross-examination, Dr. Luff said that if there was insanity in the prisoner's grandfather and uncle and nieces, it might set up possible predisposing cause to insanity in the prisoner. He could not say that many of the prisoner's acts showed that he was mentally unsound. He did not think the weapon used was an extraordinary one. It was very effective. Many persons might be callous without being insane. He continued he had seen no indication of insanity in the case. Edwards was easily found guilty of the murders and was sentenced to execution. Whilst awaiting his execution, Edwards was sent to Wandsworth Prison, where he was considered a difficult prisoner. From the Stockton Herald, South Durham and Cleveland Advertiser, the 21st of February 1903. Reported Confession Edwards has maintained his sullen, vengeful manner. He spent the night at Brixton after his condemnation in cursing and raving. When received at Wandsworth on Saturday morning, 
He refused absolutely to receive the chaplain or listen to his prayers. He spent the day yesterday in pacing the narrow confines of his cell like a wild animal and railed at his guards and caused them to move about as much as possible. You had trouble getting me out on Saturday morning, he said, referring to the barricading of his cell door at Brixton. You'll have a damn sight harder time getting me out when I swing. The task of guarding Edwards is a trying one. He cannot be punished for any of his actions in the cell or pinioned down to prevent them. As a condemned man, he has considerable latitude. He can see as many friends as he chooses and as often as he chooses, and he can order anything he likes to eat or drink. Edwards is said to have made a confession which is in the hands of his solicitor. Madame Tussauds have offered £200 for it, and another person has made an offer of £100 for the cold-ringed pince-nez, which he wore until deprived of them by the prison authorities. The question of Edward's actual sanity came up several times as attempts were made to have his sentence reminded to life in prison in Broadmoor. There had been several cases of insanity in his family, but ultimately this attempt failed. From the Sheerness Times and Guardian, the 28th of February, 1903, Edgar Edwards Sane. Specialists find no grounds for a respite of the Leighton murderer. The two specialists who were ordered to inquire into the mental condition of Edgar Edwards, the fiend in human form, whose victims, the Derby family, were found buried in a Leighton garden, have completed their report. It has been forwarded to the Home Office, and it is understood that the medical men have not been able to discover anything that would justify the Home Secretary in advising His Majesty to respite the sentence of death. The condemned man's behaviour changed considerably during the latter part of last week, and although he would not receive the ministrations of the prison chaplain, he has been very earnest in his talks with a non-conformist minister whom he asked to visit him and he has been to chapel each morning latterly, occupying the special pew set apart for condemned prisoners. Two warders sit each side of him during the service, and three others are outside should their services be required. He has also been allowed to exercise for about half an hour each morning in the exercise shed, since he has become quieter. Edwards has written a letter to one of his sisters begging forgiveness for the trouble and disgrace he has brought on the family. His mother, who is over 80 and is living in a respectable part of North East London, has been spared the knowledge of her son's position. On the 3rd of March, 1903, Edgar Edwards was hung. From the Sheffield Daily Telegraph, 4th of March, 1903. The execution of Edwards. Edgar Edwards was executed at Wandsworth Jail in London yesterday morning for the horrible murder of Mr. and Mrs. Darby and their infant child on December the 1st last at Camberwell. Edwards is said to have slept fairly well until aroused at six o'clock yesterday morning when he was also reminded that it was his last day, which he said, Yes, I'm ready. I shall give you no trouble. At seven o'clock he ate a good breakfast of coffee and bread and butter and afterwards asked to see the governor, whom he personally thanked for the kindnesses and little indulgences allowed to him. He was then seen by the chaplain and reiterated his statement that he was prepared. He, however, was nervous 
and excited and extremely pale. Shortly before the time appointed, the condemned cell was entered, and Edwards at once arose and stepped forward, to safeguard against the possibility of any display of violence, or, or on the other hand, fear by Edwards, there were four warders present. But, as events proved, they were not required, as Edwards met his death with great fortitude. He was ghastly white when led from the cell and shaking with suppressed excitement, and on the journey to the platform he made several incoherent statements and also repeatedly thanked the prison officials. He kept his promise in not giving any trouble, and both Billington and Mr. Under Sheriff Metcalf described the execution officially as very easily carried out. The lever was pulled by Billington at the usual signal while the chaplain was reading the burial service, and Dr. Beamish at once pronounced life to be extinct. Edwards was hanged in prison attire, as is the custom now, and leaving the cell he walked with firm step, but with a curious bent-forward attitude. On the scaffold he made several remarks in the form of prayer, having previously thanked the chaplain for his ministrations and making expressions of hope that God would forgive him his misspent life. His last words, distinguishable to those standing by, were, Good Lord, have mercy upon me. That concludes this episode of Serial Killer Saturdays, The Derby Family Murders. We really hope that you've enjoyed the episode. We would like to thank our tremendous supportive subscribers. Thank you. Your comments, suggestions and interaction is greatly appreciated. Thank you again. If you haven't subscribed, we would be very grateful if you did. We need a minimum of 1,000 subscribers to keep this channel alive. Please subscribe, tell your friends and share on social media. We would greatly appreciate it. We upload six days a week. Fridays are a new limited series called Forgotten Fridays, where we explore a snapshot from newspaper articles, advertisements and publications of a time from long ago. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time span of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to this 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Sundays are eccentrics as we do an in-depth look at some of the quirky, unusual, notable and bizarre characters from Great Britain, which offers up a rich supply to choose from. Mondays are murderous, where we investigate in-depth a historical murder. Tuesdays are twisted and usually involve a collection of stories based around a theme, such as stories of matricide or when employers go bad. Wednesdays are wicked in this new series that will explore outrageous organisations, bloody locations and shocking events with a bit of murder and mayhem sprinkled in. From all of us at News of the Times, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News at the Times, and I am Robin Coles.